Um, there was also a question about Humira and Tibio, so I thought maybe this is a, a good opportunity to pivot um, into um, another realm of questions for another class of drugs. Absolutely. So this one is for Remo, uh, and Remo, let's talk about anti-TNF therapy and how do anti-TNF therapies, and they're listed there, the infliximab types, which are uh, Remicade, Renflexis, Inflectra, as well as the Humira, Adalimumab, Symphony, Golimumab, and in the U.S., Sertilizumab. How do they affect uh, your risk of developing COVID-19 and your risk of bad outcomes from COVID-19? Sure. Thanks, Eric. So if we go back, I mean, it, it's, it is an interesting story even with anti-TNF therapy. So um, anti-TNF therapy has really become a cornerstone of treating inflammatory bowel disease, uh, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And you could see by the response that you in the audience gave that there's a significant proportion of you that are, are on these therapies. Um, they're as mentioned before, they're used in a variety of immune-mediated diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis or arthritis of the back, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, uveitis. Um, so there, we have a great experience with this over time. One of the things that is interesting and why we were we were a bit concerned about um, about anti-TNF therapy at the beginning of the pandemic or uncertain about it is because the very first clinical trial that uh, an anti-TNF was ever used in was, was actually in the intensive care unit to treat something called SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, not dissimilar to what we're talking about in um, during uh, this pandemic and what happens when uh, patients are in the ICU. And in that particular study, which was done uh, over 25 years ago, it was uh, prematurely uh, halted because patients actually did poorly uh, and actually died during that study. Um, now, it, I mean, anti-TNF in general is a systemic immunosuppressant. It has uh, anti-TNF as a molecule, has a lot of effects on the immune system. Uh, it's responsible for controlling and upregulating other what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, it's responsible for trafficking of inflammatory cells to the gut in some fashion. And it's also imp important in maintaining uh, its effects on maintaining the barrier function, uh, function of the gut. Um, so uh, that being said, when it started, I'll go through it the same way, is we weren't sure if you were on it. What is was it going to increase your risk of develop because it was a systemic uh, acting medication? Was it going to increase your risk of developing uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, or the virus? And is it was it going to increase your risk of developing disease? And is it going to increase the risk of developing some of the complications that we'd all be concerned about? Uh, and so as um, as time has evolved on the pandemic, I think we've gotten some of these answers, not only within the secure IBD registry, but in parallel or similar registries done in those other diseases where anti-TNFs have been used. There was enough concern in the beginning that in China, for example, uh, one of the, the first IBD cohort that came out of China, they, they essentially stopped all of these medications that were biologics uh, during the early days of the pandemic. Um, as an organization, uh, the International Organization of IBD, and then later this task force, uh, in the early days, we, we again were uncertain. But I think um, there's been several data sets, and the secure IBD data set is one of the most important ones. That uh, So as far as developing complications of the disease, it doesn't appear that at least uh, if you're on anti-TNF monotherapy, which means one of those drugs that we just mentioned on uh, that's mentioned on the slide, if you're on this alone, uh, the risk of having that sort of poor outcome, which was either having to be on a ventilator with a tube in your mouth or being in the ICU or death, that the overall risk uh, right now in the 1,511 patients sits at about 2%. Uh, which is a quarter of what we're seeing in the overall population. Um, so that was very, very good news. That is very consistent with what we're seeing coming out of other registries in other immune-mediated diseases um, to the point where um, there is actually a trend that it may be protective 
for the reasons that because when you block this, you may, you're blocking other cytokines, including uh, IL-6, um, that if you're in a different certain stage of the disease, it may uh, protect you against cytokine storm. So again, that's the hypothesis there. Now, th that risk does change if you're on this an anti-TNF and you're on uh, an immunosuppressant medication uh, such as uh, azathioprine and or methotrexate. So that 2% absolute risk uh, does increase to 9%. So in that, if you're just comparing numbers without doing what we call re uh, logistic regression analysis and looking at other factors, that 9% number is similar to the overall sort of uh, cohort number. Uh, so suggesting again that there's probably not an increased risk, um, but there's more risk than being on these drugs alone. So what does that really translate into um, in for you as an individual patient and, and how it's potentially changed our practices? So number one, um, if you're on an anti-TNF therapy, uh, we're not most of us are not recommending that you stop it. So you should continue it. Number two is we would be, I'd be comfortable starting an anti-TNF therapy, um, you know, during the pandemic uh, if need be. Um, but it, as opposed to starting it perhaps with an immunosuppressant, which we do after discussion with the patient and the pros and, benefit, pros and cons of doing that, I probably wouldn't have that discussion and I would start you as, start this as monotherapy. So that's, that's that part of it. Um, the other thing that comes into play here is you as a patient may be on an anti-TNF um, and perhaps you have developed SARS-CoV-2. You've gone out and you've been swabbed. What do we do in those situations? Remember these drugs have, because they're dosed either every other week, every four weeks or every eight weeks in, or, or in a variety of intervals, um, it's un they have what we call long half lives so they last a long time in your body um, so you but you could get in a situation where you know you've developed symptoms you've you've tested positive and you're about to get your injection and or your infusion of one of these drugs the recommendations now are that you should wait at least 2 weeks from symptom onset before you take your next dose of drug some of you may have lingering symptoms and we would recommend that you talk to your physician about that. Um, so th that's really sort of the landscape of anti-TNF right now. Again, I think that uh, the data has um, pleasantly surprised us from the perspective of, uh, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be in a situation um, where as a physician having to discuss with my patients to come off these drugs because again, I think they're transformational for those of you who are on the on them in the audience, you know the benefit of that, and we wouldn't have wanted to see the opposite data where we'd have to start recommending during the pandemic that you'd have to come off of them. Thank you, Remo and Jennifer. I think you're there still. Um, if you can hear us, what are your thoughts on anti TNF therapy, and and specifically, what about starting you know dual therapy together with an immunomodulator? Are you doing that, or you're trying to start monotherapy right now, single drug? Yeah, I mean, for, for new starts, I mean, depending on how, um, if this is Crohn's disease versus colitis and how the disease is behaving, um, wherever possible, I, I am leaning towards trying to select a medication that I'd be more comfortable with um, using as a monotherapeutic agent. Um, that's not to say that I'm not considering starting uh, an anti-TNF agent such as Remicade or, or Humira in select cases, but wherever possible, I'm, I'm trying to lean perhaps towards one that's a little bit easier to use and that I don't have to use in combination with an immunomodulator. But as was, as was echo, uh, indicated previously, I would echo that um, these medications not be stopped because there is concern about being on multiple agents. Generally speaking, if your healthcare provider has provided, has prescribed these medications to you, um, it's been for a very good reason. 